Welcome back to another episode of Introductory Organic Chemistry. Today we're going to talk about the oxidative cleavage of alkenes and alkynes. But before we get into that, let's go through the problems that I assigned last lecture. So in this first problem, we take this one compound here and treat it with two different sets of conditions to get the epoxide on the left as well as the epoxide on the right. And I wanted you to propose conditions that would selectively give us either one or the other. So in the first case, we could use MCPBA, which is an electrophilic oxidizing agent. So we'll form an epoxide on the more electron-rich alkene on the left. Now the alkene on the right is electron deficient, and so to add an epoxide to this position, we need to use a nucleophilic oxidizing agent. And so this is why we use hydrogen peroxide under basic conditions. And if you're curious about the mechanism of how that occurs, I'd encourage you to check out the last video. Then in the next problem, we have an alkene with two methoxy groups as well as an alcohol. Now if we use MCPBA, that alcohol won't get affected and will only form an epoxide like this. Now this is a rather exotic looking epoxide because we also have alkoxy groups sticking off of this. And you can imagine that if we added some sort of nucleophile to this position or this position, or used a Lewis acid to rearrange this, we would be afforded with an ester with an alpha hydroxy group. And so with that, let's get to today's material, oxidative cleavage of alkenes and alkynes. Now, while previously we've discussed about adding epoxides to alkenes, it's possible to go a little bit further and further oxidize the uh, alkene or alkyne to carbonyl containing compounds. And so there's two approaches that are commonly used, ozonolysis as well as uh, using potassium permanganate. Now, potassium permanganate is a sledgehammer. It's a very strong oxidant. It can do all sorts of reactions to different organic molecules. And so if you're using it, it typically is like when everything else fails. Both alkenes and alkynes will be converted to carboxylic acids. However, if you have alkenes with uh, an additional R group, it would be converted to a ketone instead. In general, other functional groups are not well tolerated. This kind of depends on conditions, and this is why I'm not going to go into too great detail in terms of use or mechanisms for potassium permanganate. Generally speaking, if you use ozone, however, you will cleave alkenes to ketones or aldehydes. And so here we can see that if we have this disubstituted alkene or tetrasubstituted alkene, depending on what the Y groups are, we'll get aldehydes or ketones. However, with potassium permanganate, we'll usually get ketones and carboxylic acids, or just carboxylic acids in the case of alkynes. If you use ozone, this will also convert alkynes to carboxylic acids, depending on the workup that you use. Um, if you're curious what ozone looks like, there was a great video by Chemical Force showing liquid ozone reacting with several different reactive reagents, and I'll post a link to that in the description. So some considerations when you're working with potassium permanganate is what the conditions are for the reaction. And so temperature plays an important role in predicting reaction outcome. If you have an alkyne and the solution is neutral at low temperature, you'll tend to get 1,2 di ketones instead of carboxylic acids. If you use alkynes uh, under more basic conditions at high temperatures, you'll tend to get carboxylic acids. However, if you're using hot potassium permanganate, many other groups will react. If you're using alkenes at a cold temperature with a high pH, potassium permanganate can form 1,2 diol. So this would be dihydroxylation of an alkene, which is a topic we're going to talk about in the next video. If you do alkenes with hot KMnO4, you're going to further oxidize them to carboxylic acids as well as ketones if they're further substituted. In general, though, I wouldn't recommend using potassium permanganate if you have other options at your disposal because side reactions can often occur. And even if you do form your desired product, if other products are formed, it can be challenging to separate and isolate the desired product. Now, one example from the literature of a potassium permanganate mediated oxidation is the cleavage of this phenylacetylene to two equivalents of this benzoic acid product. And so in this case, because it's under relatively mild conditions, there's, this isn't hot, it's done in water, we don't get any oxidation of the methyl group to a benzoic acid, which could happen, or further oxidation of this ketone to a benzoic acid. We only get cleavage of the alkyne. So this is kind of an exception to the rule, where this worked quite well. Now, if you'd like to see all of the different reactions that potassium permanganate can do, I would encourage you to read this review article from the Electronic Encyclopedia of Reagents in Organic Synthesis, which talks about specifically potassium permanganate. Now let's talk about ozone. Ozone will react with alkynes and alkenes, just like KMnO4 will. However, alkynes are pretty selectively converted to carboxylic acids, but occasionally you will form 1,2 diketones. If you do alkenes, these will be converted to aldehydes and ketones, but if you change your workup conditions, you can often favor other products, 
but most of the time, if you're doing a reductive workup using zinc, dimethyl sulfide, or triphenylphosphine, you should have relatively predictable reaction outcomes. And this reaction has been used a lot, and hence it's a reliable method. The only disadvantage is you have to have an ozone generator, but nowadays you can buy those online relatively easily. If you have some functional groups that could be oxidized, such as a free amine or a thioether, there could be some side reactions that happen, but in general, ozonolysis is a fairly robust method. So the mechanism of the ozonolysis reaction is first ozone undergoes what's known as a 1,3 dipolar cycloaddition reaction. So ozone forms a 1,3 dipole. This negative charge is the partially negative portion, and because there's this partially charged oxygen next to the terminal oxygen, the terminal oxygen is also partially positive. So the alkene is able to attack at the partially positive oxygen, the negatively charged oxygen is able to attack at the alkene, forming what is known as a malozonide. Malozonides can rapidly uh, break down into an aldehyde as well as this carbonyl oxide, which can then undergo a rearrangement reaction where they reform this ozonide. Ozonides are fairly stable, so to get the desired aldehyde out of these reactions, you have to work them up. So this could be done with a reductant such as dimethyl sulfide. This mechanism shows what that would look like. So this dimethyl sulfide is able to attack at this oxygen, which liberates one of the equivalents of aldehyde. Since R and R prime are different in this case, you might form two different aldehydes. Then in the next step, the alkoxide is able to collapse down, displacing DMSO as a leaving group, and we've formed our two equivalents of aldehydes, as well as our DMSO. So I'm going to show you a couple examples of ozonolysis from the literature. In this first case, this tri-substituted this tri -substituted alkene is converted to an aldehyde as well as acetone, which I haven't shown, but the other portion of the alkene would be converted to acetone uh, as they did a reductive workup with dimethyl sulfide. In this next case, you can see this interesting ring expansion reaction where this uh, cyclooctane containing indole is cleaved to this keto amide, which is an 11-membered ring. So this is quite an impressive looking compound, and it was actually a challenge for me to draw this. Uh, since it's such a large ring. Um, but it's interesting to see that this electron-rich alkene was very easily able to react with ozone, while the benzene ring was mostly untouched. It's fairly difficult to oxidize a benzene ring with most common reagents that we discuss. However, there are methods that exist. So one thing I want to highlight here is, if you have an electron-rich alkene, it will be more reactive towards ozone, because it's fairly electrophilic. So this would react faster with an electron-rich alkene when compared to something like a Michael acceptor, like an alpha-beta unsaturated ketone. So for this lecture, I'd like to assign two practice problems. First, show the products of the following reactions. We take this, cyc we take this cyclohexane containing uh, alkene, treat it with ozone and dimethyl sulfide, we will obtain one product. However, if we treat it with MCPBA, we'll get a different product. If you're not sure which product we'll get with MCPBA, I would encourage you to check out lecture 26. In the final set of practice problems here, I'd like to show that you can take this one compound and convert it into these two different products depending on the conditions that you choose. If you've been paying attention to this lecture and the last lecture, you should very easily be able to propose conditions that will give you this epoxide on the left, as well as this keto aldehyde on the right. And so with that, I hope that this has been a very useful lecture on the oxidative cleavage of alkenes and alkynes. Next lecture, we'll talk about the dihydroxylation of ketones, uh, sorry, rather the dihydroxylation of alkenes, as well as the oxidative cleavage of diols with sodium periodate. If you have any questions or comments, please leave them below, and it would really help if you gave this video a like and subscribe, or even better, share it with one of your friends who's struggling with the same chemistry material that you are. With that, have a great day.